Thank you, gentlemen. Now, continuing on the trend of picks and bans, we saw the Carthus come out here from AHQ, and you know there was a discussion at the beginning of the day about Westor's champion pool that he does favor the assassins, but has recently extended his play to those control mages. Now, we thought going into this, he wanted to help the side lanes out, and he's taken a little bit of a hit in the mid lane matchup. You know, he didn't necessarily out CS, for even in his own region. So we see the Carthus pick. You're going to focus the side lanes. They do a gank in the top lane. The reason that gank doesn't work is because Hecarim, with the smite, he's able to start flask, do a camp, not buy potions, TP to lane and has a cloth armor. Instead of five potions in the ward, he's got a cloth versus a double physical of Jarvan and Nar. Survives the gank, gets away. Now, HQ can't really focus that lane anymore. Their summoners are down and he's still in lane, very healthy. So every, every gank from then on from AHQ is telegraphed to the bottom lane. All EDG has to do is out-rotate them, be there as well. And you saw clearly, just sit around bottom lane, wait for a thing, and you get triple kills left, right, and center. Yeah, I want to pick up one more time on the Kalthus pick because we have seen kind of this Kalthus pick like this before, um, going for Tia Riley's to protect the Kalista, and this is kind of the team comp that AHQ is going for. And what you actually expect was that Kalthus is farming up a lot, but what we've seen before from Westor is that he's actually down in CS in the one game. He played 20 CS by 10 minutes and 50 by 20 minutes. And that's actually huge if you're a Carthus player. So I had my doubt going into it and I don't think it paid off as well as it should have. Yeah, I definitely think that the overall team comp didn't really do what it was supposed to do. You're supposed to kite back through, but there was just mm. so many beefy people. They didn't care if they sat in the Carthus in the end. And we saw as soon as EDG were comfortable that they were able to win a team fight. Every single time they have an opportunity, ward vision or not, they just set up for it, make sure they're in the right position. Coral in the top lane, by the way, he was equal in kills to the Nar and just did so much more with it. Went outright tanky with that Cinder Hulk, uh, the challenging smart was just able to delete people off the map. They as soon as EDG ever get a lead in these games, they're just going to look to take over. Well, and there's an interesting uh, thing here, Zyrene, in that in each of these three matches of the day so far, we've uh, determined a you know a greater and a lesser team we've said here's here's the favorite here's the underdog but in all three of these games the underdogs have come out swinging yeah and i really really like seeing that because the underdog are playing to their own styles they're not being gun shy as well you're seeing mountain like flash o eq over a wall level three to try and get a kill to try and make something happen four man gank on faker faker mid then they get to look at these things go back and be like okay that didn't work let's reevaluate but they're being aggressive out the door because if you try to be something that you're not as a team you're not going to learn because you're just going to look back and be like we didn't actually play our style on the world stage so now we don't know what to improve so i like that they're coming out and getting the most out of this experience and to that end in my opinion this was the closest game we've oh. seen so far <laughs> which is interesting considering that we're all coming in here probably regarding edg as the team to beat so you know props to ahq there for sticking with them so closely through the early parts of this game i think that this entire tournament is going to be closer than we had imagined at the start I think as well that if you look right now at the meta game, the diversity is just so huge and everything is kind of close. So if you go for a team comp, it's less punishing and less snowbally because you usually don't go for this double assassin that like instantly deletes you or is like uh, fail or like super success. So I think that maybe the meta right now is playing into the favor of, you know, the lesser teams. Well, before we get into the rest of the match, we are going to send it over to Shox, who is joined by a member of the victorious Edward Gaming. Uh, thank you very much, Dash. I'm joined here by Pawn, who played a fantastic Cassiopeia in that matchup. Also by Ho Min, who's going to be eating for the translation here in this one. Um, great victory, very first game here for you guys at MSI, though. AHQ put up a good fight, had a very annoying compositions to fight against. So how did that work out for you guys? 우선 HQ 전 승리 축하드리고요. 근데 HQ 상대 픽이 되게 이제 상대의 걸 끌었을 것 같은데 좀 어떠셨나요? 어저 상대 픽이 CC가 많긴 했어도 확정 그런 건 없어가지고 고스트를 들면은 쉽게 피할 수 있을 것 같아서 별로 상관 아 신경 쓰이진 않았어요. Um, their picks had a lot of crowd controls, but they didn't have any like definite stuns. So I thought if I had ghosts, I would be able to dodge them. So it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a big deal. Well, you guys seemed very calm after the victory as well. Not really celebrating. Is that because you got the eyes on the prize? How much do you want to prove that you guys are the best team in the world at this tournament? 
경기 승리 직후에 되게 차분한 모습 보여줬었는데 혹시 그 이유가 우승하기 직전까지 뭐 긴장감을 안 풀라고 그러신 건가요? 어 일단 저는 대회 때 그렇게 긴장을 하는 편은 아니라고 생각하고 HQ랑 일단 스크림에서 저희가 진 적이 없어가지고 이어도 딱히 그렇게 기쁘거나 하진 않았어요. Um, normally, I don't get too nervous during tournaments, and we never lost a game during scrims against HQ, so it wasn't that different to me. Not, not that different. Now, not getting very nervous. You guys are up against SKT later here in the day, and SKT has chosen Easy Hoon to go up against your team the next match. You do have historically a winning record versus Faker, so do you think that influenced their decision, and why do you think they want to go with Easy Hoon to play versus you? 오늘 나중에 SKT랑 경기가 남아 있는데요. SKT 팀에서 이제 미드라이너로 이진 선수를 기용하기로 했어요. 근데 아무래도 폰 선수가 과거에 페이커 선수 상대로 좋은 모습 보여줘서 그런 것 같은지 생각을 알려주세요. 어, 저랑은 크게 상관없는 것 같은데 일단은 이준 선수가 나와서 처음에 어, 활약을 하고 그 다음에 페이커 선수가 나오는 식으로 좀 많이 봤던 것 같은데 그 한국 대회에서. 아마도 이번에도 그렇게 하는 거 같기도 하고. Um, I don't think it really has anything to do about me, but I think SKT strategy is about just having easy in play first and then Faker come out later. So I think that's the way just do it. All right. Well, good luck in that matchup and congratulations for the very first win here at MSI. We're going to go back over to Dash and the guys over at the desk. Thank you, Shox. Now, before that interview spawn, I had to cut you off so we could get there. I want to give you the opportunity to give your thoughts on how that match played out for EDG. Yeah, I just think everyone was saying it was a really close game, probably the closest game yet. I don't think that game was ever in doubt. That was a very Chinese-style game. They played it exactly how you would, very, very slow, measured. They got the skirmishes that they were looking for, and as soon as those team comps were locked in, like, you cannot give Deft Ergot in this current meta. You saw how decisive he is with his ultimate. Their composition was that tanky that the longer that game went and that is what EDG has shown on this patch that they want to do like the more out of reach it was going to Sejuani versus Jarvan the Hecarim versus Nara I just think that these champions have that much more upside that the longer the game went as soon as it hit 40 minutes it was going to explode anyway during the game Quickshot had inquired about the Hecarim Nara matchup and I think that a large part of it came down to the itemization and the pressure that both teams put on the top lane after the first gank nobody came top to actually get any any kills going on there. So it was an extended laning phase with the exception of just TPing bottom and trying to help out in that, ten, uh, I believe it was a 10 minute skirmish in the bottom side. And NAR itemized a Randuin's first item. That slows the attack speed and movement speed with the active. That doesn't really do anything to the Hecarim or the Urgot for that matter. Sejuani is not a physical damage jungler. So I thought that was a really poor itemization choice. With an extended laning phase, you can go for a more damage oriented build such as the Frozen Mallet, really punish the Hecarim. You know, he gets bonus attack damage from movement speed. Constantly slowed, less damage, worth trading. It's also pretty good for, against Cassiopeia. You know, you hit her once, can force a summoner. She's not very mobile unless she hits the Q. And to prevent the Q hitting, you can go for a Banshees instead of the Spirit Visage. I personally think that the Banshees is a better choice simply because they don't really have ways of poking out the Banshee spell. Just really an Urga E, which is an important spell to, to dodge in a team fight happening, or an Alistar combo, perhaps a Sejuani ultimate. So I thought the poor itemization from the top laner really caused Kuro to have a really easy time in lane, and perhaps could have punished him a little bit more. Yeah, I think we're looking at the lane as an isolation a tad too much for how EDG are playing this game. As soon as they saw that Callista, it was going to be a Hecarim 10 out of 10 times if it's not taken off the board. Hecarim deals with Callista so well. If you're a Nara, it's very hard to stick on top of her. With Hecarim, you get that flank, you get the home guards in. Even if she gets landed away, you have that huge ultimate to chase her down. I think that they overcommitted on their bottom lane there. They tried to get them something that they're comfortable and proven that they can play in the past. And Koro really punished them for that with his pickup. Yeah, I think especially Koro, I think this is where in the end everything narrowed down to the TP play. This is actually how EDG came out ahead and um, late. We have a replay, so let's pull that up and I'll let you continue on with your explanation. We're gonna go 23 minutes into the game. This ends up being a four for one in favor of EDG. Take yeah, what away. you see here is Hecarim coming mid lane, trying to go for West Door, um, chunking him down about half HP, a little bit below, and then everybody is collapsing onto the Hecarim and he gets really, really low. Getting this low, needed to, uh, to use the ultimate. And now I want you to look out what exactly is happening here. They use not the Sejuani ultimate and they still have the TP. 
on the side. So Koro is like going back to base instantly. Meanwhile, they are skirmishing out uh, the fight and everybody gets kind of lowish. They trade summoners. Uh, Fresh re-engages here and this is the point where EDG is saying, okay guys, we can still fight here, we can still go. Boom, TP behind them. What a beautiful ultimate, hitting four people, so important, and EDG just going ahead from this point out. And this is the team that has three Chinese players and two Koreans. They, that, those comms look absolutely flawless there, if you just look at that team. The fact that Koro has the TP flank and that the Sejuani ultimate comes and they bait them into this power vacuum where it looks like they're in a bad position, so people are drawn into that spot. And then the flank comes out with just this huge, massive, Pecorum TPing into the back, which completely changes the flow I think that fight. It's a really good display of a yeah. longer skirmish and how you actually bait the enemy going into and still having the Sejuani and Hecarim TP. So I think that was really well played. Yeah. Uh, the big question mark for me here on the side of AHQ is the Jarvan pickup. I mean, I do understand that he is looking for some early aggression and trying to find a way to give his team some gold to work with, but especially when you do pick up the Callista, Karthus, Nar, things that can go decently late into the game, but then you supplement it with a Jarvan up against Sejuani, Hecarim, or Cassie, like you're not going to win the late game and you didn't take early enough laners to win the early game. It just doesn't seem like the composition is there. I think the Jarvan pickup is always questionable in the current meta. The problem was that EDG went with the first pick Sejuani with the Gragas ban, so the two best team fighting champions right now are completely removed off the table and they banned Twisted Fate. So if you're EDG going into this, you're thinking, how is Westor going to impact the game? You know, he's, uh, he's the star of the team, he wants to help the team out. Twisted Fate, Globals. We talked about the Karthus, Globals. Okay, if you pick Karthus, you're going for a team fighting composition. Let's get out one of the team fighting champions pick the other, and now the jungler isn't the best team fighting champion. If that was a Gragas instead of the Jarvan, it might have been a completely different game. I doubt it, but it would have been better for the side of AHQ. Yeah, I think Nuno is the optimal pick there. You've already gone with Callista. You've got the Rylaz on your Karthus to help her kite back. You create another zone with that absolute zero. <laughs> Nunu completely shuts down Hecarim before he gets his damage item. Once he gets the Trinity Force, he can go through it with a Sheen proc, but up until then, he kind of does struggle against the Nuno. I just think there was better things available. Is yeah, right? and I know that the Jack question, the Rek side ban in favor of the Sejuani being picked up, I don't know, I think maybe banning the, the Sejuani and forcing them to actually play that type of squishier style and then pick up the Nunu for yourself may have been optimal because they probably would have first picked the Rek'Sai in that case instead of the Sejuani. I think that they utilized the Sejuani wonderfully. You saw that yeah. in the last team fight and I think right, if you have... Take it away from that. Yeah, ju just, you know, take it and utilize it as you did and you're totally fine, so... It is a difficult situation though, because well, Clear Love is really good on Rek'Sai. Yeah. I'm a huge advocate for Nunu, but when you look into the idea that AHQ came in to really focusing the bottom side, it can be quite difficult to focus that bottom main against the Urgot and Alistar. You know, the only really good gank path that you have on that is ganking him from behind if you're the Nunu. So a snowball, Alistar headbutts you back, gank's already over, nothing's happening. Jarvan offers a little bit more pressure, but, you know, versus a team like EDG, you're gonna get out rotated, they're gonna get there faster, the TP's coming first. All right, well, I feel like this is a game we probably could talk about forever. There's a lot to discuss. Very exciting when you see two early game teams come up and butt heads against each other. We are going to step away, though, while Besiktas Esports Club and Team Solo Mid load onto the stage for our fourth game of the day. So don't go anywhere. EDG takes on AHQ for our third game of the day here at the Midseason Invitational. Oh, he's on to death. He's chugging the potion, but it's the hit coming in from Albus, and they keep going for clear love, but get knocked up by Mako. Looks like EDG's able to assess this one just right. Westor very low, but in a great spot to defile damage. Dodges the Arctic Assault, but he wants to stay in the fight. How many arrows does he have in <laughs> clear love? Rend it. Goodbye, and the insta flash from Def AHQ now scattering despite that fantastic gnaw, it's not going to be enough. 28 to 10, EDG come out strong with a 35-minute game over AHQ.